Hello and welcome to The Small Briefing. I'm Brian Kelly, CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's show. I want to say hello to one of our new VIP members, Interstate Healthcare. They're located in St. Clair. So welcome Charles, Marlin, and the whole team there. Um, and of course, we are welcoming them on behalf of our sponsor, Consumers Credit Union. Check out Consumers Credit Union at consumerscu.org. So we took, a, we took a week off from the briefing, Brian, and uh, now we're kind of jumping back into everything. We're going to talk more about inflation during Data Monday, but let's talk about some new threats on the horizon um, related to increased oil costs. Yeah, this is energy is one of those base items, those base commodity items that can't win it. When the cost of it goes up, it can permeate throughout uh, the entire system and drive the overall inflation numbers higher, which of course is um, is problematic. Now we have seen in recent quarters we've seen the uh, the cost of goods and commodities start to come down, even as the cost of uh, of services has continued to stay high or even go up. But with uh, with respect to energy now, um, the new threats on the horizon are that the um, the OPEC countries are are uh, working in unison to restrict supply to drive up price. And while long term that never works because when the price goes high, then there's a big incentive for each of them to kind of cheat on their quotas. But uh, but in the short term, it does drive uh, prices up when they take steps like that. So as we've seen. Um, Absent that type of an action, I've actually had some confidence that inflation will slowly uh, continue to, um, to to fall when you look, especially look at year over year numbers, even if any individual month might not uh, necessarily go down. But the um, but that uh, th this is a new factor, and if the uh, if the commodity prices and base energy costs do spike up because of this, then it really can, um, it, it really could um, impact the, the overall, um, it, it could really impact the overall inflation numbers. Uh, I, I think that this could be OPEC, the OPEC country's way of trying to get ahead of a slowdown in the economy. And what happens when the economy slows, demand for energy goes down. And, uh, and so if they have higher production at a time when demand goes down, of course, the, the price will go down quite a bit. And obviously that they don't wanna see that. We love that as energy consumers, they don't wanna see that uh, as energy producers. So um, this is uh, a new risk or a new factor out there on the horizon uh, that could have an impact on the overall success that we have in reducing inflation in, um, in the United States. Now, this is one factor, a lot of factors, and um, there's some other things that that a uh, lot of other things that lead me to believe that, you know, throughout this year, we are still going to see a, a decline overall in inflation. Uh, but this will be something that will at least slow it or maybe for a time uh, could potentially for a short period of time, uh, even reverse it. OK, let's let's take a, a new topic here on TriShare. And TriShare is a policy that SBF supports. It creates a shared agreement between employers, employees, and the state of Michigan for child care. And they've kind of taken a big step forward. Let's let's talk about that and some news for this program. Yeah, TriShare is something that SBM took an interest in pretty early in the process. Actually, we're involved in, in supporting the development of the um, of the policy itself, and then the implementation done uh, in the beginning as pilots, but now starting to spread across the, the state. The concept here is uh, child care costs for employees, uh, for employers to be able to, uh, to offer this benefit to employees at a higher income level, uh, so not just limited to people of poverty or say 133% of poverty, but really getting up to like 55,000 or so uh, to, to have the, the, the business as a benefit pay a third of the cost, the employee pays a third, and the government pays a third. And uh, the government does pay a lot into child care subsidies today. And this would stretch those dollars further by putting this tri-share program together, purely voluntary program. And um, it has spread across many um, uh, regions in the state, but it's difficult to get it to scale. And um, Hemlock Semiconductor, which is a bigger company, um, 
they uh, they're the newest produ uh, the newest employer to uh, to participate in TriShare, but it's a big step forward. 139 um, employers overall are um, are participating at uh, at the moment, so it's still kind of in its new stages. But this is a big participant in this region. It really will help the program get to scale faster. So um, hopefully, it'll make the uh, the program more accessible and more stable for more uh, organizations to take uh, advantage of it in the future. So uh, even though Hemlock is certainly not a uh, not certainly not a small company, the um, the fact that they're participating in a program that uh, that we strongly uh, support, I think will overall pay dividends to just the longevity of it and the availability of it, uh, especially in the region where they operate in that Bay, um, that Tri-County area in the Bay, Re the Saginaw Bay region of Michigan. Definitely some exciting things happening, happening there. Um, we shared an article in our newsletter today, SPM sends out newsletters every Monday. And this one is about new rules uh, from the Department of Labor regarding the PUMP Act, which is the Protections for Nursing Mothers Act. And um, basically, they're expanding some protections um, under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So, Brian, do you have some more details on this? Yeah, so this goes into effect um, on the 28th of this month. So this is a, a change in law that took that uh, that passed and was signed previously the PUMP Act, but um, but with a going into effect on uh, the 28th of, of uh, April. So the rules that have now been um, have uh, been published indicate um, the what has to be done. And so the just to give a, a few examples, we just posted an article from our partners at ASC that will um, give you a lot of information on it. But um, employee, employers must permit employee breaks for lactation or pumping of milk. Um, this is regardless of exempt or non-exempt status. So whether somebody's salaried or hourly and exempt or non-exempt, um, that this is something that is um, that is universal in that um, in that sense. The um, it covers all employers, uh, but businesses. There's a, a bit of a carve out, but not an absolute carve out. Uh, businesses under 50 employer um, employees may um, be exempt if they can show that compliance will result in undue hardship. That's just speaking from experience and reading these rules and knowing uh, challenges. And that's a really high um, bar to to meet. So I think that it you know, the safe place is to 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 be for any business, even if you're um, you have a small, relatively small number of employees. Is to uh, is to act as though this applies to you because you'd have to show a hardship uh, exemption in order to not comply with it. Um, it requires a private space be provided that is not a bathroom. Okay, so you can't say, well, the bathroom or a bathroom stall is uh, is the um, is the designated place. It must be shielded from view and should not allow for intrusion by coworkers. Or the public, uh, honestly, really common sense uh, type stuff that I would hope that most uh, businesses would already naturally be inclined to do, um, and I ex expect would be naturally inclined to do. Uh, but it's in the law now, and there are published rules, and it goes into effect on April 28th. So you should know that um, the space can be temporary. So you don't have to say that this, you know, here's a room and it's forever designated just for this purpose. It doesn't have to. You have to be like that. It can be temporary in its nature, but I would encourage you to take a look um, at your uh, at the article there. ASC did a really nice job of laying it out, and um, and just uh, make sure that you're uh, you're compliant. And again, you know, you'll see down there that you can uh, get a hardship exemption if if you have a smaller number of employees. But um, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't advise trying to rely on that. All right, let's talk about another article from our partners at ASC. And this one is for employers who file EEO reports. Um, there might be a change on the horizon in regard to collection requirements for race and ethnicity. Yeah, and this is, um, there are a couple of different changes that they're proposing. The first, and they're, and they're, they're actually, at this stage, they're looking for input on potential changes. And, um, the, the way that this is laid out to not, now is they ask for race and ethnicity 
um, for bigger employers, by the way. So if you have to fill out the equal employment opportunity reports, th this applies to you. So 100 employees or more. The, um, with, there's uh, there's a kind of a two-step uh, process. You ask people about their race and their ethnicity. And so the first kind of bit of feedback they're looking for is, is this too confusing? And then they, they give um, an alternative possibility where they would put that really into a single question. So it's, you know, the idea is making it more uh, streamlined. The other thing, the other uh, potential change that is, uh, has really been debated for a long time is the idea of separating out um, white European from uh, in European descendancy or heritage from um, North Africa and Middle, East, Middle Eastern origin. And uh, this, there's an acronym, MENA. So um, the, uh, and it stands for um, Middle East North African um, as a separate category. Right now that's all classified as white. And, um, and so the, there's been an effort for a long time to say those should ought to be separated out. And, uh, and so that uh, this here in Michigan where there is a uh, fairly substantial Middle Eastern, um, Middle Eastern population, this is an, a pretty important issue to, uh, to certain parts of our state in particular. So uh, while you may not have heard about this uh, anywhere, we actually at, at SBAM have heard from uh, organizations and businesses about this rule, even ahead of this article being published by, uh, by ASC about the, the uh, proposed changes and the feedback. So if this is something you have an, an opinion on, please take a look again at the article. Uh, from uh, from ASE, we didn't um, uh, we trust them with their uh, with their content. They're great partners that we when we work together on uh, on content have for many years. Uh, so uh, please do take a look at that. And if it's something that that affects you or that you have an opinion on, now would be the time to speak into the process and the, into the rulemaking because there is still time to uh, to influence it. All right. So SBAM supports criminal justice reform and the idea of using problem solving courts. And there's a new report out that's highlighting the employment outcomes for those who are who go through the system. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, we have we have a pretty extensive criminal justice reform agenda at SBAM. We support a lot of um, a lot of different efforts that are aimed at getting more people with criminal backgrounds in back into the workforce. So we don't like people sidelined. Work, labor force uh, participation in Michigan is stubbornly below 60%. And, um, and so we, we just want as many people as possible back into the workforce. One of those things in the criminal justice reform are problem solving courts. You might know them as sobriety courts, drug courts, um, the the, uh, the idea of, uh, and there, there are veteran courts, um, there, there are different specialty courts that try to get to the root of the problem. So a person committed a crime, but go upstream and what, what was it that resulted in that person committing the crime and dealing with that problem. And um, was really heartened to read uh, the, uh, the report that the Supreme Court uh, just published for fiscal year 22, on, um, on the results of the drug courts, but in particular, the um, unemployment numbers. So unemployment dropped by 88% for adult drug court graduates. So drug court, that's one category. Those who went through that 88% less uh, unemployed as compared to people with drug charges that didn't go through the drug court. Okay, that's the comparison here. And then 86% for uh, sobriety courts and 85 for the hybrids that put drug and sobriety uh, courts together. So uh, they take a treatment-based approach and there's a lot of accountability. They use medically assisted treatment. Um, and it's a, uh, in many cases, it's, it's really um, proving to be very successful. But I wanted to highlight it here because um, our interest being in getting people back into the workforce uh, the results are showing that um, that it's not just better, but substantially better outcomes when we have problem-solving courts that don't just punish for the crime, but also have a treatment component to to uh, solve the issue that led to the crime, the crime being committed in the first place. 
those are really, um, really encouraging numbers. Let's talk a little bit about um, a, a project, the Goshen Project, and this is an MED, MEDC supported project that Congressman Molinar has actually now come out in opposition against. So remind us about this project and tell us a little bit more about this, um, this opposition. Yeah, and this is something that um, I, I think is gaining traction to where I wanted to, uh, to mention it today because there's a lot of, uh, lot of incentives used for uh, battery manufacturing plants. And um, there's been noise around this one because it's a Chinese company. And, um, and Chinese companies are um, owned or controlled by, um, by, the, by the state, uh, not the state of Michigan, but by uh, their country. Um, in this case being China. And um, when it, this local opposition, when I saw it kind of reach the congressional level, I think it does put it, it puts the project in a, in a different type of a category in terms of, you know, whether or not it's, it's going to come to fruition, you know, taking on this type of opposition, I think is, is pretty noteworthy. Um, and reading the op-ed piece that uh, Congressman Molinar uh, published, it said, um, that uh, Article Nine of the Articles of Association of this of uh, require Goshen, the company, uh, to quote set up a party organization and carry out party activities in accordance with the Constitution of the Communist Party of China. The company shall ensure necessary conditions for carrying out party activities. End quote. That um, that's the um, that's the sort of thing that. Um, it's really, I think the structure of the deal may or may not be able to, of the incentive going into the project may or may not be able to deal with. But um, this type of opposition going from a lot of local um, meetings uh, to, to a point of congressional opposition, um, whether or not they'll, you know, they'll be doing hearings, there's legislation now proposed uh, as well that was also highlighted in that op-ed piece. It, uh, I think it makes this project um, more, um, more questionable than, um, than say the Ford project, which has um, you know, a battery plant and big incentives and, a, um, and using some, uh, some technology from a Chinese company, but not having ownership, of course, of, uh, of Ford or the venture in Marshall. So this is, um, I think this will be one one to watch. This was a big kind of celebrated deal when the deal was landed, but uh, but one that um, is seems to be taking on quite a bit of water. All right, it is now time for Data Monday. I am going to uh, to run through a few different things here that are um, I think kind of interesting. A few um, I'll say. Um, encouraging signs, and then, uh, but, but, um, you know, overall, I think not particularly surprising. The um, the first one is just a uh, from a survey, and it's showing the over the what people or consumers are expecting to spend more or less on, and this is organized on the things that people expect to spend more on in the future, and. Um, of course, the survey was taken going into spring break time, so um, travel was number one uh, in terms of the things that people expected to, to spend more on. But healthcare, household maintenance, um, vehicles, and restaurants, bars, and then um, financial services, of course, interest rates and things going up as well. Um, at the bottom, gambling and um, fitness and gyms, educational services. Uh, movie theaters, live entertainment, sports, and so forth. Um, so uh, just kind of an interesting survey. This was asking over the next six months. And, uh, and if you're in the, it looks like maybe uh, if you're in the, in the travel business, then maybe, then, uh, you know, maybe it's going to be um, good times ahead. But I would also point out that it's also, um, People are expecting. Uh, there are people on the other end of the spectrum expecting to spend less on each of these categories as well. Just kind of an interesting um, survey that comes out from time to time. Um, let me. Uh, oh, I never went to the slideshow presentation. Did I just jumped right in? Um, 
This, uh, the next one is uh, personal consumption um, expenditures and, um, and then the, the core. Um, this is, an, this is a, an inflation measure and you'll see the year over year um, numbers have come down. Um, so again, pretty encouraging except for this, um, you know, this core number, this orange number, which is kind of taking out those fast moving commodities. Yeah, it looks like it's coming back down again, but but not you know not impressively so. This has been that stubborn number that has stayed a bit higher, and really, services are the things that are is the is the part that's keeping that number higher. But again, looking at it, not surprising, not way out of the um, the ordinary, or not way out of what economists expected to see. Now, looking at month over month numbers, if you look at the um, at the, the orange here, so the same color scheme, the core month over month actually went up higher. Um, and so what that says is that you actually had deflation in the commodity um, items. And, and so, you know, it's it, those, these March numbers are more in line with a de declining trend. Uh, we had the, you know, we had that higher than expected February, but, um, this, um, you know, I don't look at this and say, hey, this looks great, but, um, but it's not like February when it's like, wow, are we, are we heading into another big problem? Um, another thing that uh, gives me some confidence that thing, you know, that cool off is actually happening, which will probably result in cooler inflation. Um, the Dallas Fed, their, they, their, their survey on conditions they show that both um, loan demand and uh, credit standards or the terms, the credit standards that, that banks and credit unions are offering both um, declining and not just declining, but substantially so. So as in, you know, the interest rates are higher. So those are the terms and conditions of loans, how much collateral is required, loan, loan to value, credit standards, interest rates, all that. So the conditions for borrowing have um, declined in the, uh, and then with that, the demand, so people aren't as likely to want to get into additional borrowing now. So it's um, it dropped down pretty low on the previous quarter and stayed low in the first quarter of this year. And then um, the labor force participation rate. Um, here's a bit of, um, I would say, generally positive news. This is the national number, but the labor force participation rate among what the economists call the prime working years, 25 to 54. That uh, is at 83.1%. That is exactly what it was before the pandem pandemic fall. So it has finally, <laughs> so the core um, part of our labor force has finally reached pre-pandemic levels. It has not yet in Michigan, but uh, across the nation it has. And, um, and usually even when we lag the national average when the national goes up, um, it's a good good sign that maybe ours uh, can at least crack sixty uh, percent overall. And um, here's just looking at um, at our neighbors. So these are the Great Lakes states and labor force participation uh, going back to oh, around the time I was born. Uh, but it, as you see, there was kind of an arc to it. But Michigan is um, is here at the bottom of all the Great Lakes states. So. We are at like, I think it's 59.8% uh, right now. So just below uh, 60%. Um, the, the top performer is, um, is Minnesota. And Minnesota has been the top performer um, throughout the last 40 plus years. Wisconsin has been the number two performer the last 40 some years. And uh, you'll, you'll notice if you're to really dig into the population there, educational attainment appears to be a pretty big driving factor. Now, I, I do want to point out that while I've uh, maybe sounded a little bit hopeless about labor force participation rates in Michigan, um, that, that the odds are stacked against us, our population is older than average, our um, outbound migration uh, and the um, an overall loss of population and um, kind of the upside down nature of, um, of deaths being higher than births each year. Um, it's not impossible though, if you look, here, here we've got a stretch in Michigan. We we hit that that 
great recession that just kept on going and going and going for us and labor force participation rate went down low, it actually did go up for the better part of a decade. So it's not impossible for our labor force participation rate to go up. It has gone up and, and not that long ago since it was, but it takes a lot of consistent long-term positive economic activity. First order of business, get it over 60. Um, now looking at um, overall earnings for, um, for hourly workers, you'll see that there's been a, a long-term increase here, this blue line, and that's a, um, you know, the, the total uh, percentage increase just stacking on top of each, uh, each year. But the more, um, I think the more meaningful uh, aspect of this is showing that it was up 3.2%. This is a year over year number, but looking at the, um, at the numbers from last month, up 3.2% year over year. And um, that is um, a, uh, a good sign, I think, that the, uh, what's pushing the, the, um, the inflation numbers, especially in the service industry. According to this, it actually looks like it's getting to a normalish range, because if you look at that 3.2% increase, um, and then draw the line all the way back, you'll see it's not terribly out of line with our history. You know, big up, big down um, around uh, around the, uh, the the time of the you know the early stages of the pandemic, but the um, but where it stands today is not it's on the high side of normal, and that's a good sign that um, that the the forces that are pushing inflation up are starting to cool down a bit. Also, um, another. Um, uh, I guess I'll call it an encouraging sign from an inflationary perspective is that um, the jobs report for last month coming out showing 236,000, pretty close to what was expected. So this would not be considered a bad or a good. This is a lukewarm um, jobs report. Now, if you were to look for the first quarter though, remember in January when it was much higher than expected, about 500,000 nationally, um, it's still a million jobs in the first quarter. So that's a lot. But um, again, if you're trying to get inflation down, low labor force participation rate, um, getting these jobs numbers um, to more moderate, lower levels actually helps with inflation. Again, I know it's not the way that we normally think about these things. Um, I think more jobs, good, but when you don't have enough uh, people, you already have inflation, wage inflation driving a lot of it. Uh, if the goal is to get inflation down, there's some glimmers of hope here. The, um, and then looking at the um, underneath that. So in this last slide, we're looking at the totals. Underneath that though, there's a different category of permanent job losers. So these are jobs that have gone away and aren't, aren't coming back. So the permanent elimination of jobs, 172,000. So there's other new jobs. These are net positive numbers. You can see there's a lot of new jobs that are created. There's some that are going away forever. And you might think, hey, that's great. Um, you know, people just go from this job to that job, but oftentimes that is not how it works. The ones being created are a different type of skill set. And the ones that are going away leave people displaced that are not um, well suited to just go into the newer opportunities. Um, and then looking at the, the last slide here, the overall unemployment at three and a half percent stayed really stable uh, there nationwide. Again, Michigan's unemployment is a little higher than that, but um, the, uh, the national no numbers look um, pretty stable. So overall, when I, when I went through all these numbers, it just looks like a, um, a, 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 a cooling off in the, um, in the employment categories, which are the ones who are uh, where the the that where the inflationary pressures are still coming, that's um, so it's a good sign from an inflation perspective. Um, but I think it's important to acknowledge always that um, by solving the inflation problem, it it literally creates problems for other people in other ways. And so um, the trick for uh, the Federal Reserve and for our economy at large. Is to, um, is to try to get that inflation number under control without causing too many other problems. And in this case, um, it, uh, you know, the, from an inflation standpoint, it's a moderately, um, um, moderately encouraging report. 
even though I think that it, it, uh, the exact same indicators also point toward more likely later on this year, um, higher pr uh, probability of a recession. All right, that is all we have for you today, but I do wanna let you know that next Monday, so April 17th, um, SBAM will be in our Macomb region for an owner to owner event. And this is actually going to feature discussion with Amy Hubby, who is the executive director of MISHTA, that's the Michigan State Housing Development Authority, and Brian. So if you are a small business owner in um, the Macomb region, check our website, sbam.org slash events, and join us next Monday. Uh, have a great week. We'll see you back here on Thursday at 3 p.m. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you on Thursday.